So we are happy to welcome our speaker tonight. Um, and Constantine, we don't know you that well, so we thought we'd go with the conservative one. This was actually our first idea to welcome to our stage Dr. Constantine Batigan. <laughs> <laughs> it's always scary to do that to a guest that you don't know. But but you know what's weird is I actually have exactly the same picture that I made myself. <laughs> <laughs> so just great minds. You know? That is great. So um, as I mentioned, we've got these uh, rings of many, 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 many particles on the outer solar system, not as dense as Saturn's rings, but nonetheless the same idea. And they tell us a lot about our solar system. So um, as I said, this was something we took from your website. Can you tell us what we're looking at there? Absolutely. Uh, so these are beautiful ellipses. Um, <clears throat> these are actually the most distant orbits uh, of the solar system that we know of. So what we have, um, <clears throat> just to give you a bit of scale, if you, if you look at that purple, uh, purple ellipse, that purple ellipse at its furthest point from the sun, which is that bright star right in the center, is a thousand times as far away as the Earth is. So that's, that's kind of the scale of, of what we know at the moment. Now, um, allow your eyes to kind of ignore the, the cyan thin, uh, thin lines here. These guys are a somewhat separate story. If you just look at the, the um, ellipses that look like they're in the plane of uh, of the screen right here, right? You will notice that they're all kind of corralled. It all looks like they're they're all pointing in the same direction, right? I'm not the only person who sees this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's actually a remarkable, remarkable dynamical feature of the distant solar system. Um, if you zoom in somewhat and check the remainder of the Kuiper belt. This will not be the case. It's only the most distant orbits that are all pointing in the same direction. And that, that confinement, that clustering of orbits, is actually what's giving us a hint, uh, a gravitational signature, if you will, of the existence of Planet Nine and not, not stupid Pluto, right? <laughs> uh, but, the, but the actual Planet Nine, which is see, whose orbit is seen here as the orange ellipse. And actually, I, I should say, Pluto is a wonderful little world, right? I mean, like I have, I, when the New Horizons pictures from 2015 came back, I mean, I, I was just genuinely amazed by them. You know, especially the parts, the geology of Pluto is so, so much more rich than what anybody could have expected. The uh, kind of on, on the plains, you see um, kind of the cracks in the ice uh, where, where the convection cells are coming up. I mean, it's just the coolest thing, but it's fun to, uh, you know, to this Pluto. Anyway, uh, <laughs> let's keep going. <laughs> okay, so, um, so we've seen that picture of the sort of flat distribution. We see this crazy distribution. So that brings the question, what actually is the Kuiper belt? And I'll begin by saying it was, it's named after a guy named Gerard Kuiper. There he is. We looked for a picture of him standing up so we could Photoshop a belt on him, but you know what? We couldn't find one, so we just uh, put all those around. Um, but anyway, uh, as the, we'll just leave it here, and any visuals you want to show, this is the last we have for you. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you, so um, so tell us about these different populations. So the ones that are the flat, they have all kinds of crazy names like QB1 and Plutinos and qb and what are all these different populations and what do they tell us? When I say populations, I just mean bunches of these things that have common characteristics, but they're they're, they're, they're Indeed. distinct. Indeed. So what do they tell us? So um, really, the, sol uh, the Kuiper belt is, um, is exceedingly rich in the information that it, it tells us about how the solar system formed. The solar system, we used to think about 30 years ago, um, hadn't evolved, right? I mean, generally, when you think about space, you kind of are tricked into thinking that it's immutable, that things are just going around, and it's all kind of happening slowly. So you think that there's this constancy to the solar system. That's not true. The solar system formed in a state that is quite different from the architecture that we have today. In particular, the outer, sol the outer planets of the solar system. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune all formed considerably closer to the sun than they are today. And after about 600 million years of staying in that state, and that's about 10% of the solar system's 
lifetime to date. They underwent a, a transient period when they scattered one another. They, they went unstable and jumped. So their orbits changed. They expanded by about a factor of two. During this instability, which is uh, this class of instability models is often uh, referred to as the Nice model, um, all of the icy debris that was in that region got scattered out to beyond Neptune. And that the remainder of that population is the Kuiper Belt. So what we see today, if you will, are the small pieces of the shipwreck that is, that is the solar system. And that, those small pieces tell you a lot more about what happened, the dramatic story of our solar system, than the planets themselves, because there are a lot more of them. And you can study that, their structure in much greater detail. So these populations have different distributions and dynamics and motions. Mm -hmm. And they talk about the, the different eras of the scattering. Uh, absolutely. In fact, uh, why don't we switch over yeah, to my laptop. And I have a, uh, a little video here of, of the solar system to scale. Um, so we have here uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth. My house is right there. And uh, there's <laughs> Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Um, in a second, we will see uh, Pluto. Right, so Pluto, as you already mentioned, is not exactly in the same plane of the solar system as are the remaining planets, and will go to the plane of the solar system in a second. You can see that sort of 25 degree tilt. That indeed was the first hint that Pluto was actually uh, part of a population that is different from the planets themselves. And now what we see are all of the Kuiper Belt objects for which we have really good orbits. Okay, so this, the sizes of the dots are not to scale, but the orbits uh, that are shown there in orange are. So from here, you can, you can tell that the Kuiper belt is not really a, um, a ring in the same way as Saturn's rings are rings. It's not flat. Saturn's rings, by the way, are as tall as Griffith's Observatory, approximately. That's how flat they are. This, um, the Kuiper belt is a giant donut. And indeed, if you study the, the populations, the, the kind of different substructures within the Kuiper Belt, there's a, there's a very rich story to be told. But for today, I think it would, be, it would suffice to um, concentrate on two, right? One is the, the, this extended donut-like collection of orbits, and the other is this ring of material that is actually quite quite in the center, in, in the plane. So the, that kind of lining of the donut, so to speak, is called the cold classical Kuiper belt. And MU69 is a member of the cold classical Kuiper belt. The cold classical Kuiper belt, we think, is the only population of small bodies in the solar system that hasn't been disturbed. Right? These are the only objects in the solar system that formed right there, and they stayed right there. The remainder of the Kuiper belt was emplaced where it is today by scattering off of Neptune gravitationally. That's why all of these orbits seem to physically hug the orbit of Neptune. Neptune kicks them out, and they evolve in this interesting way, but they always come back more or less to where they started. The orbits that don't hug the orbit of Neptune are the primordial members of the solar system. So before we move on to some of the crazy outliers yeah. which you've been working on, let me just uh, ask a couple quick questions about the cold classicals. Because of M MU69, um, first of all, uh, what do you think the results that we've seen so far tells us about the cold classical population? Oh, that's a great question. You know, so one of the biggest problems of solar system formation for the last maybe four decades has been how do you form the building blocks? Right? We see the castle that is the solar system, but we don't understand the bricks. Why do we not understand the bricks? The reason is, if you try to form objects like MU69 or asteroids or whatever by taking little you know, rocks this big and convincing them to stick together, it doesn't work. In fact, by, by that method, you can at most build something that resembles a snowflake. As it turns out, if you take snowflakes, so anybody who's been on the East Coast knows this, right? <laughs> snowflakes do not come in 
you know, five meter, uh, five meter rocks. <laughs> Unless you're in Russia, just things, weird things can happen in Russia. Okay, but um, right, typically snowflakes reach about a centimeter, and then if you uh, take two centimeter snowflakes and kind of gently allow them to collide, they break apart. Okay? So there's a there's a barrier to to growth, and. The uh, new theory of planet formation emerged in the last decade or so, which suggests that rather than being built up piece by piece, the way these objects form is that in the protoplanetary disk, snow, basically snow forms these big clouds uh, through something called the streaming instability. And once these clouds grow massive enough, under their collective gravity, they will collapse. Okay? And they will collapse and they will make these sort of 20, 200 kilometer bodies. Right? Now, when that happens, you, you can't violate the laws of physics. You have to conserve angular momentum. So that process of collapse is subject to the same rules as a ballerina that jumps up and brings her arms in and spins up. Right? If you ever watch ice dancing or, or whatever, when ballerinas jump up, they, her, they bring her, their arms in and they do a 560 or whatever. Okay? So during that process, what happens to these clouds? Well, it turns out they can't, there's too much rotation to just collapse them uniformly. And it turns out what, they, what happens, they will collapse into two boulders that will go into orbit around one another. So what we see with MU69 is a consequence of those two boulders that then probably tidally decayed upon one another and then just stuck. Now the Earth's moon, due to tides on, on Earth, is moving out. Mars's moons, one of Mars's moons, uh, is actually moving in. So we see a consequence of that same physics in the distant solar system. It's really, uh, it's really a fantastic result. And they refer to them as planetesimals mm -hmm. because they're the building blocks of planets, like you were saying, the, the, the bricks. So a totally important question is, what's the composition? Absolutely. If we're looking at these things that are the leftovers from our solar system <laughs> formation, but they haven't fallen into the inner solar system. They haven't been toasted up by the sun and lost their, their gases or melted or reformed or any of that stuff. They're as they were when the solar system formed. So um, you heard me ask about uh, composition to Alan because that is one of the huge questions. What is that and how did the composition of the building blocks for the solar system turn into the planets we know and love, especially this planet that we know and love? So there's a through line from that little rock out there to those of us sitting in this room and planet-wide, all the life on Earth, uh, because that's, that's us when we were when we were babies. <laughs> OK, with that negative 4.5 billion years <laughs> yeah, it's old. Yeah. So um, let me turn then to the rest of the Kuiper Belt, because that's uh, you know, what we're mm -hmm. seeing here in the classical. What's, the, what's all that other junk, and where did it come from? And you know where I'm going next after I, I want, well, I suspect you know what I'm going to ask you next about the crazy flying out ones. Why are they oh, yeah. doing that? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, look, this, this part of the Kuiper Belt that you see up here, this is the so-called classical region. Um, it's about 40 times as far away from the sun as is the Earth. But now, if you ask what are the most distant orbits that we know of today, right? They, they swing out like that. Now, this, uh, this is an object that my uh, friend and colleague, Mike Brown, discovered back in 2003. Um, he nicknamed it Sedna. He discovered it together with David Rubino and Chad Trujillo. Um, by the way, Chad Trujillo is part of the same team that, that discovered Far Out. Oh, okay. oh what, what a guy. Um, now, uh, would you it, care to comment? We aren't live streaming, so no, no. He's a great guy. He's a friend of mine. Uh, yeah. Is he the one that came up with the name Far Out? Though I think it was Scott, actually Scott <laughs> Shepard, uh, who's also on the on the team. I think Scott comes up with the names. So their previous one was the Goblin, um, <laughs> which is which is also a. a a pretty good name. Some people like that it. That is a good name. Um, uh, anyway, so it's it's kind of a thing, um, right? One of the great joys of discovering a Kuiper Belt object is you get to name it. 
Um, <laughs> maybe. Um, so so uh, you know, people come up with cool nicknames. But here's the here's the neat thing about Sedna. So if you look, if you just look at this orbit, it just it is staggering how elliptical and how how stretched out and just how big it is, right? I mean, that's the most astonishing thing about. Here, here's the really weird thing about Sedna. Okay, if you look over here, actually, it doesn't hug the orbit of Neptune. Right? That's actually the most staggering thing about this object. If it was just a really far out ellipse, okay, all that that would mean is just like this object would have been gravitationally scattered by Neptune and would have almost zero energy, meaning it just like just barely attached to the solar system. This object doesn't come anywhere close to Neptune. So some other gravitational influence is required to explain its detached orbit. And now for about a decade, I mentioned that Sedna was discovered in 2003. For about a decade, it was the only one. And when you have one weird data point in the scientific field, you tend to invoke a theory where you're like, I don't know, like some stuff happened to Sedna. <laughs> it's like four and a half billion years ago, like bad stars or something, right? Um, so so that's, that was kind of the explanation for about a decade. Uh, but then a decade later, Joe Biden was discovered orbiting the solar system, okay? On an orbit like this, okay? Now, Joe Biden's orbit is actually even more remarkable than Sedna because even at closest approach to the sun, it's 80 AU away. So once you have two data points, you draw a line through them, it's just like big deal. I okay. just have to point out the VP in the name, like MU69. <laughs> <laughs> so. That's right, that's right. So again, uh, you know, when you're up at the telescope, it's like 14,000 feet, there's no oxygen, so you get, you get real creative uh, with stuff. Um, so really the discovery of, of Joe Biden uh, was, the, was, was the inspiration that uh, led Mike and me to kind of look into this um, more closely. And what we noted right away, this was back in 2015 or so, is that if you look at the most distant orbits that we know of, not only some are some of them detached from Neptune, they all seem to kind of Number one, lie in more or less the same plane, right? As you rotate it through, you can almost put a piece of paper through this uh, collection of orbits. It's about 20 degrees inclined with respect to the rest of the solar system. And as I already mentioned, they're all pointing into the same direction. And that's really weird. Why is it weird? It's weird because if you leave the solar system alone for a geologically short time, like 100 million years, this pattern would disperse quite rapidly. Right? So the fact that they're, they're all clustered together means that there's some gravitational influence that's, that is cl uh, keeping them um, together. So for the next 48 minutes, I would like to explain <laughs> this. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's a, the only place where this, yeah, the only place where this slide did not get any laughs uh, was I once gave a talk at a math department and they said, all the rest of your slides are crap and this one is pretty good. <laughs> um, That's great. Yeah, so, so just to uh, kind of close up the story, um, you know, it is no longer the 1800s, so we're no longer limited to just doing math on the board and we have computers now. Um, and in fact, my office sits a couple floors above a supercomputer that um, was used to make uh, this, this simulation. So what, what we see here, this is a simulation of the solar system's lifetime, the distant solar system uh, evolution over its four and a half billion year lifetime, where the orbit of Neptune, okay, 30 astronomical units, 30 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun is about this big, um, all of these dancing ellipses are the, the distant Kuiper Belt objects that are simulated in, in, my, uh, in my code. And what we have here is an additional body of the solar system, an additional massive object in the solar system. So if you kind of watch this for a, a while, it looks like nothing interesting is happening. The orbits are dancing around. But if you watch it for a very long time, okay, a pattern begins to emerge. Okay? And I think um, 
we're at about 1.9 billion years into the simulation now. Uh, it, it is starting to be the case that the surviving objects of the distant solar system are all pointing the opposite way from the orbit of, this, of the, the actual ninth planet, right? The real deal. Ninth planet. Um, actually, that's another. That's a good name for the planet. Real deal. The real deal. <laughs> Far out. The real deal. Oh, sweet. Um, sweet. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, right. I know we're at right. seventeen hundred feet above sea level. That's right. Um, so. In the end, it is simulations like these that tell us the story. Uh, it's simulations like these that suggest uh, that indeed the distant uh, solar system is is hinting um, the structure that we see there now is is pointing at the existence of a, of a ninth planet, and its orbit is very weird. It's unlike anything else in the solar system. Its orbital period is about 10,000 years. Its orbital inclination is about 20 degrees. It's 20 degrees inclined with respect to the rest of the disk. And that's actually where that uh, tilt of the observed orbits is coming from. And finally, its orbit is, is quite a bit more eccentric than the rest of the solar system. So, uh, so we're very excited about it. Um, and this is a good, maybe 30% chance, maybe 40% chance that we'll find it uh, within the next couple of months. We have a whole bunch of data that we took in December at, um, at Mauna Kea, the Subaru telescope. It's so much data that we haven't looked at it yet, not because we're lazy, well, in part because we're lazy, but <laughs> also because it takes a really long time to process it. And um, it is going to be, this month is going to be a lot of work to, to chug through this data and to understand uh, what we found, if anything. So there are a lot of mysteries that, uh, that exist out there yet to find. And in fact, I think that um, the folks who found far out were looking for Planet Nine. Indeed, yeah. So the, uh, that group, that team, uh, which primarily consists of uh, Scott Shepard, Chad Trujillo, Dave Thulin, um, they are on the same quest as we are. And you know, we're, we're friends, we're, uh, we're friendly, uh, we're also uh, somewhat competitive, uh, well, I think they, they are a little bit maybe more competitive uh, than, than we are. Uh, maybe we are more competitive, I don't know. Uh, but it's, it, you know, it, that, that aspect of competition actually keeps the science fun, right? Because we, um, in the end, you know, when we're on the telescope, we're kind of thinking, okay, you know, like this is, this is it. Like we we've got to we've got to do this. Um, you know, there's always the possibility of getting scooped. And uh, my friend Eric Pettigura, who's a, also an astronomer at UCLA, is here, and he, uh, you know, we we often connect over this this excitement of, of doing the science. It's, it really is a wonderful adventure. Well, um, just to finish up a little bit on the the picture of. Um, the outer solar system and, and with MU69 in particular and New Horizons in particular, one of the things that I mentioned earlier you couldn't really see because of the sun angle whether or not there were a lot of craters. But a first look sort of suggests that there were not a lot of yeah. craters, which is interesting because it's supposed to be filled with debris out there. It should be a certain impact rate. And you, there, we have predictions, very clear predictions, about how many of how, what size you should get. So this is a, an exciting thing to try Absolutely. to understand the nature of the environment in which the, the object exists. Because it hasn't come into the inner solar system, it's being processed entirely by its environment out there. But um, New Horizons will do more still to explore the environment out there. Um, and uh, because it has been ever since it got to sort of just past Neptune and in the uh, early front or the inner edge of the Kuiper belt has started measuring all of the fields and dust and uh, particle environment as it's traveling and, um, and it's just going to be like a line as it goes farther and farther from the sun measuring the particle environment, the dust environment and, and what the uh, what the Kuiper belt is like out there, um, and then can compare it to the surface of MU69 and see if it all comes together in a consistent picture about what that outer 
uh, edge of the solar system is. Now it's going to be a long time before New Horizon gets out to uh, any of these more distant objects, but it is still a very healthy spacecraft. It still will be taking images, and in fact, because it's already out there, it will have better resolution than Hubble does even though Hubble is a very high resolution telescope, um, for some of those objects. So it's going to look for them. It's going to look for rotation curves that follow up on the ground um, here. Any looking for any pecu peculiar uh, variations in light or, you know, that, that it will find. And, um, and I mentioned earlier the sort of ground truth uh, proof of that occultation method <coughs> allows further studies for every one of these objects that, um, that New Horizons finds. We'll be able to do those occultation studies and have sort of a zoomed in look at, uh, at the shape and see how many of them are these bilobed mm -hmm. features, which as Constantine was describing and I was describing a little earlier, is what we think is the formation mechanism uh, for that out there. So there's a lot of, I mean, like I said, we look at it, we think, oh, oh, isn't that a cute little bowling pin with some smushy looking things on it? But there's amazing science to Absolutely. be had in it. Absolutely. And this is a somewhat unknown way. Everybody knows about, you know, my mother and pizza and whatever that thing's all about. I guess not pizza because, oops. My mother just did something with very nice what? <laughs> Am I talking nonsense? Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. My very excellent mother yeah. just served up nine pickles. Pickles. Oh. pizzas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, doesn't any? Didn't everybody learn that in school? What I learned. <laughs> the one you learned what? I just learned the planet names. Is Ruder? Oh, well. <laughs> We're not live streaming, but we still are a public institution, so we'll save that for another day. Anyway, um, the point is that it's not that there isn't, you know, it's not that Pluto's de been demoted. It's that there's this whole third zone of which Pluto is a sure. wonderful member. Uh, MU69, Sedna, Maki Maki, um, Biden, we left Biden off our, our graph, sorry oh, about that. I don't, don't tell bad. Joe. Um, and we, we make plenty of jokes around Joe in this show, so it's, it's all right. Um, but anyway, uh, I know that we're gonna want you to come back and well, uh, give us the skinny on this, and especially, you know the first place you're gonna come as soon as it's found, right? Oh, yeah. Griffith yeah. Observatory, right? Of course. Yeah. Of course. Okay. After all, we don't live stream and we can keep it a secret until you publish. Yeah. It'll be fine. That's right. <laughs> so um, please do remain up here. We have only two very brief stories to tell before break, but I would like to take this opportunity to thank our speaker again for just a wonderful and last. <laughs>